Good morning. morning. Y'all well rested (laughs) for holiday weekend. Yes, y'all well rested? Yes, it's a holiday weekend, yes. Yes, it's summer, it's beautiful, right? Well, my sermon this morning is kind of a BOGO, a two for one, if you will as um, I found sort of um, a connecting theme between this morning's epistle and the gospel. So the title of my sermon this morning is, The Thorn in Your Side Might Be Your Own People. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity this past April to visit the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., where they do a really good job of outlining the very complicated and convoluted history of the Bible as we know it, and showcasing all of the texts of the Bible that exist and the variations for the many other sects and denominations of Christianity throughout the world. My beloved had to pull me out of the museum as there were sections I wanted to revisit or I thought we had missed, even as my eyes grew weary from reading and my low back achy from standing and my legs wobbly from walking, if you've ever done museum hopping in Washington and D.C. One of the many reasons that I do not argue about the Bible with those who wish to debate its contents and meaning is because of its incredibly complex history and context. This is very different from respectful and heartfelt discussions on its various spiritual meanings or engaging engaging in passionate intellectual theological discourse. I love the contradictions that exist within the oddly chosen 66 books we use, and I am intrigued by the controversy that continues among scholars, churches, and believers as to the true meaning behind any given scripture. It is sort of a historical document without being an accurate record of historical events. It is a book about people who really lived, yet not a purely factual account of their actual lives. It is born from various cultures and ancient languages and a finite period of time Yet, through oral retellings and multiple translations, its themes remain universal and timeless. The Bible is a collection of stories, myths, mysticism, magical moments, and miracles, which are nearly impossible to prove. And yet, we believe it because of faith, the substance of hope, which we cannot see. We believe in the immutable power of the Bible. And to me, that is incredible. Many biblical scholars, theologians, and those who preach and teach the Bible, we would say that we owe much of this great work to one man. The second most important figure in the Bible, second to Jesus, is Paul. Now, Paul is a complicated biblical figure for sure. And I'm, I'm not going to get into all, all of Paul's complications this morning. That is for greater theological minds than myself. But Paul does have a pretty dramatic conversion story. You know the one where he was on a mission of persecuting Christians, and on the road to Damascus, he is struck blind for three days by a vision from Jesus. He later goes on to create the ideal example of a missionary ministry, dedicating his life to both creating and spreading the gospel of Christ. He is attributed to have authored about half the books of the New Testament and many of the Pauline epistles. You know the ones written to the various church communities that were being created. Romans, Galatians, Corinthians, Thessalonians, Philippians. Paul was a very busy man and an essential figure in the creation of the early church. Paul also had a mystical, personal experience with the divine and created one of the most indelible Christian metaphors as a result, the thorn in the flesh. In today's epistle from 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses two through six, Paul writes, almost like young people do 
in code today, when you read things online, like when they say stuff like asking for a friend, <laughs> if you know, you know. You know the little wink, wink, nod, nod, inside joke as if he's talking about someone else when really he's referring to himself when he writes, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise, heard inexpressible things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, <laughs> except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say because of these surpassingly great revelations. So Paul recounts this mystical experience with God and tries to downplay it with, I don't know if it was waking or sleeping, which is what he means by this place called third heaven. He doesn't know if it's in the body or out of the body, which makes it mystical and mysterious. It's in paradise, but inexpressible things happen. He can't really talk about it. He's being very careful about how much he brags or rather boasts about the experience. Because the scripture goes on to say in verses 7 through 10, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So all of a sudden, Paul's language becomes plain. So we find out that the reason that Paul purposely downplays these powerful mystical moments with God is that God has shown him a more important sustaining grace through hardship. Paul describes this hardship or possible affliction as this symbolic thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, a torment. This language lets us know how deeply painful and agonizingly disruptive, disruptive to his life it is. He pleads with God three times to have it removed, and God has offered him sufficient grace for God is more powerful in weakness. Paul has an even greater realization, which he will boast, which is that God is most powerful when we are at our lowest and most vulnerable. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We remember God most when we are most in need. We reach out in despair and desperation for his grace or his unmerited favor, kindness, and compassion. Now, we all have that proverbial thorn in our side that cannot be moved. Something that torments us privately, publicly, physically, medically, personally, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. Now, when I am working with first-generation college students at the U, who are learning to deal with faculty, faculty for the first time, I tell them the same thing that I used to tell teenagers that I counseled who were struggling with their parents. I warn them about not coming against the tension between grace and mercy in these relationships. I tell them that grace is a gift of great compassion that is given to you and you don't even know it. Now, mercy is often something that you must ask for, dare I say, beg for, with great humility when you have done wrong 
are falling short of expectations. Be mindful, I tell them, to stay in the good graces of people. I caution that grace is in limited supply. Now God's grace is limitless and made more perfect in our weakness as it turns us closer to God and it is sufficient for us no matter the thorn, even if that thorn is our own people. Now that brings me to the story of Jesus found in today's Gospel of Mark. Now to summarize, Jesus goes to his hometown to preach, teach, and show the people who he is and what he can do as the living Christ, the Son of God. And they do what people from your hometown do, and they basically say, who does he think he is? Ain't, ain't he the son of the carpenter? Ain't that Mary's boy? Ain't that James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon's brother? Don't his sisters live around the corner over there? Now the scripture in Mark chapter 6 verse 3 actually reads, And they took offense at him. And Jesus responds in verse 4, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. Now, I love, love, love these stories of Jesus in his full humanity. Is there anything worse than when you go back home to show them all you have worked so hard to become, accomplish, and achieve, only to be reminded of some embarrassment from childhood, or to whom you belong as your parent's child, or your siblings, are not being seen as a whole valuable individual person? What if your family of origin is toxic, broken, or completely disconnected from who you are? What if this limited view of who you were shrinks who you are so much that it robs you of your power? Has that ever happened to you? When you return home, or to a place, or to a people from your past to show them who you've become, for them to only see who you used to be. It happened to Jesus. And you know what? He couldn't stay there. Because he couldn't be his whole powerful self there. Verses 5 and 6 read, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around from village to village. Jesus left, and he went where he was welcomed and valued for who he was. He then called the 12 apostles to him, which is a small mention in verse 7, but I think it is so important because he called his closest connections, his community, his chosen family, those who knew him best to him. Now, he is Jesus after all, and he could have just sent the blessings of ministry just out to, to, to the 12. He could have just shot it out to them. But instead, he called them to him. Then he sent them out in pairs with specific instructions on how to proceed in their mission, including what to wear and what to leave behind as they proclaimed the word and worked miracles. Now, he could have sent them out individually, but in pairs, they could keep each other encouraged as they journeyed together in ministry. In verse 11, Jesus instructs, and if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Now, I know this passage can be taken many ways, and I want to be real careful right here, and I just want to pause, because I don't want it to be said that your evangelist of spiritual healing was up here breaking up families and friendships and, and, and marriages up here in the pulpit. 
But this patches, passage for me, it does mean that it's okay to walk away from what's not for you. Go where you are welcome. Leave where you are not. Everything ain't meant for everybody. The thorn is that we cannot change even our own family or other people's perceptions of who we are or how we choose a more perfect grace from God that they do not understand, accept, or just outright reject. The Bible does not call for us to jab ourselves with this thorn time and again, but to live with it and move on. You are not meant to be diminished and belittled by others for God's sake. Faith is sacred, intimate work. And when rejected, you need to shake that off and move on to what is for you and where you are welcomed. A grace that is made more perfect in weakness is personal and hard. Paul is clear about that. Even Jesus experienced that in his humanity. But once you know God's grace, you know it. It is a knowing you cannot force. You can only offer and invite others to know this great love, this gift of grace for themselves. You know God's grace. It feels like true love, that peace that passeth all understanding just as we know what it feels like to be welcomed. It reminds me of a song they used to sing in the churches I grew up in, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Lord. Go where you are welcomed and know God's perfect grace. Given everything that has gone on in our country over the past month since I was last here with you, and all that there is to come this year for us as American citizens, I thought it fitting to reread with you this morning Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, to you enthroned in the heavens, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, and the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he show us his mercy. Have mercy upon us, O oh Lord, have mercy, for we have had more than enough of contempt, too much of the scorn of the indolent rich and of the derision of the proud. Amen.